tutataga nyamu mpeleza ya fe Okukutu usake vya kagwao Happening now the commander in chief for this covid response and is also the commander in chief in Uganda i want to say a special appreciation to you for your very decisive uh, directives in this response and for your being very up to date with the response in Uganda my second appreciation goes to the health workers who are at the front line. We appreciate you, you are doing a good job. Hang in there, we are all in this together. And lastly, allow me to appreciate the population of Uganda. You are good, you have been great, very, very committed and united in this fight. And we want to say a big thank you to you. I will now give my statement to the people of Uganda. Uganda registered her first case of COVID-19 on Saturday, 21st March, 2020. The confirmed case was a 36-year-old Ugandan male who arrived from Dubai on Saturday, 21st March, 2020 at 2 a.m. aboard Ethiopian Airlines. As of today, the country has registered 44 confirmed cases of COVID-19. The majority of the cases were travelers returning from the United Arab Emirates, 14 of them, United Kingdom, 14, and other countries, Germany, one, United States of America, one, Afghanistan, one, China, two, However, some districts have also registered confirmed cases, including Masaka 3, Hoima 2, Ajumani 1, and Iganga 1. It's not clear if these were secondary to the ongoing active transmissions. That said, all the confirmed cases have been admitted in Entebbe Grade B Hospital, Mulago National Specialized Hospital, Ajumani and Hoima hospitals. All patients presented with mild symptoms and are improving on treatment. I would also like to reiterate that Uganda has not registered any COVID-19 related death contrary to social media posts. As a disease surveillance measure at border points, a total of 2,000 661 travelers have been identified for either self-quarantine or institutional quarantine since January 2020. 1,015 high-risk travelers are currently under institutional quarantine, including those from the United Arab Emirates who responded to the Ministry of Health call to report to Mulago for assessment. A total of 660 contacts to the 33 confirmed cases have been listed and are being followed up. From the time of the declaration of the outbreak of COVID-19 in China on 31st December 2019, the government of Uganda swiftly moved in to put in place proactive measures at Entebbe International Airport and at the inland border points of entry to prevent importation of the virus into the country. However, due to the large number of Ugandans returning home from several countries that were closing up, COVID-19 got into the country. Many of these returning travelers integrated into the communities undetected, largely because they had no symptoms, in particular high temperature, which we screen at the airport or at the border points of entry at that time. This in turn dictated a change in the strategy from prevention of importation to suppression of transmission. First, 
Several countries were added onto the list of high-risk category to prevent more infiltration, explaining the large number of returning travelers now in institutional quarantine, 1,015. Second, the contacts of all positive cases were listed and are being followed up. To emphasize and strengthen this measure, His Excellency the President of Uganda on the 18th March 2020 declared COVID-19 a national emergency and has seen issued 23 guidelines on preventive measures to suppress the spread of COVID-19 in Uganda. It is important to mention that the current national emergency demands a multi-sectorial approach, which is being coordinated by the National Task Force in the Prime Minister's Office. And that this press statement restricts itself to the strategic response by the health sector. I will now go ahead and explain the lockdown. So the question is, why the lockdown now? The purpose of the lockdown is to suppress transmission by reducing the number of people, any undetected yet positive case in the community. We know from evidence across other countries, Japan, South Korea, and others, that extreme social distancing is an effective intervention to interrupt transmission and keep other uninfected members of the society healthy. In other words, this measure breaks the chain of transmission. The goal is to ensure that each confirmed case infects less than one person on average. Science tells us that this level of transmission interrupts the growth of the epidemic, which is why some people commonly call which is what some people commonly call flattening the curve. There are two routes to achieve this. Mitigation is one of them. Mitigation means slowing, but not necessarily stopping the epidemic spread. This is done by isolating suspected cases and their households, and social distancing the elderly and people at highest risk of serious illness. Mitigation may reduce peak health care demand while protecting those most at risk of severe disease from infection. However, this may not work in our setup with a large number of youth, 75% of the population, and overcrowding in urban areas and centers of business. Moreover, the same only works when you know the cases infected which as per today, we cannot certainly say, with the exception of the 44 under treatment. Suppression. Suppression or basically a lockdown, which aims to reverse epidemic growth, reducing case numbers to low levels by social distancing the entire population, and closing schools, universities, places of worship, markets, etc. This is necessary in part to halt secondary transmissions from those yet undetected cases in the community, but also to enable their eventual discovery as they develop symptoms. Studies show that, though extremely painful and undesirable, lockdowns work as is evidenced by the trends of the, of the pandemic in Wuhan city. And that is the reason why Uganda has adopted this measure. Without any lockdown or social distancing measures, the epidemic will get out of hand. Basically, what this means from the modeling so far done is that Uganda will have 18,878 cases at a 3% fatality rate meaning we lose about 566.34 people by April 31st, 2020. This is unbearable.
our already constrained health system and something had to be done immediately. And we want to appreciate His Excellency the President for taking that action promptly. So all of you may be asking, what will government do in the 14 days? I will now explain what we shall be doing in the 14 days lockdown. Number one, government must rapidly find and test suspected cases. And this will be done through two ways. First, Ministry of Health has obtained the passenger manifest of the travelers dating back to the 7th of March 2020. This manifest will be correlated with the health forms filled by the travelers and will be used to track all those who returned during the period 7th March to 22nd March when the airport was closed. They will be screened, tested and followed up closely under institutional setup. Two, all confirmed cases will be isolated and duly treated. Three, all the contacts of any new confirmed cases will be traced, found, tested, and duly institutionally quarantined for follow-up and testing for 14 days. That was action number one. The second action, test all those under institutional quarantine to weed out asymptomatic cases and institute more strict quarantine measures. So all the 1,015 people under quarantine beginning today will be tested. So our teams are out there removing samples for this procedure to start moving. Action number three, government will also strengthen the available systems to ensure that people who suddenly manifest symptoms are picked up and well managed so as to improve outcomes and or minimize deaths. I will now speak about human resources. Government has strengthened the COVID-19 pandemic response by beefing up the Ministry of Health teams with specialist doctors from the Uganda People's Defense Forces Directorate of Medical Services. We have Brigade, Brigadier General Dr. Stephen Kusasira, who is currently supporting the Director General of Health Services in his oversight role. And Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Henry Chove, a senior consultant epidemiologist. Dr. Chobe is now the new COVID-19 incident manager and is deputized by Mr. Atek Kajirita from the Ministry of Health. In addition, 82 UPDF medical personnel of different categories are supporting the response in various fields of case management, surveillance, logistics, etc. Furthermore, Following approval of Cabinet, the Ministry of Health is recruiting 220 health workers of different categories to support the response, both at the center and in the districts. Adverts were sent out and applications have been received. The interview process is commencing. In order to curb the spread of COVID-19 in Uganda, the Ministry of Health is working with its partners to undertake a number of interventions and I will now outline the interventions. The first is decentralization of management of COVID-19 cases. As the country starts to receive confirmed cases up country, the ministry is decentralizing the management of cases to the districts to stop people traveling to Kampala or Entebbe for screening, testing, and treatment. People with COVID-19-like symptoms are advised to call their respective district health officers and district surveillance focal persons. The contact numbers per district is available 
on the Ministry of Health website. And each district has been requested to widely publicize the phone numbers so that the population is aware of them. Callers with suspected symptoms of COVID-19 will be advised to stay in their homes until a team from the district health officer's office arrives to assess them and take their sample if necessary. The suspected cases will be advised to remain in self-quarantine until lab results return. The district rapid response team using a motorcycle will collect samples and send them to Entebbe, Uganda Virus Research Institute, through the Ministry of Health hub system. Results will be returned to the districts within 14, 48 hours, depending on the district's proximity to Kampala, because time is spent during transportation of the sample to Kampala. The Sample Transport Network. The Ministry of Health has an established and effective mobile transport network to transport samples from the laboratory via the hub system to Uganda Virus Research Institute. Hub systems are located at regional referral hospitals, general hospitals, and health center fours. All districts have a surveillance focal person and a laboratory focal person. Alerts from the various districts are directed to the surveillance focal persons or the DHOs by the village health teams or individuals. The surveillance focal person investigates the alert and if it meets the case definition, requests for sample, requests for sample removal. Once a nose and a throat swab sample is collected from an individual by a laboratory specialist, it is transported to a hub for special packaging. The specimen is then transported from the hub to Uganda Virus Research Institute, either through the Ministry of Health vehicles or the poster bus, where investigations are conducted to establish the status of the sample. Results are communicated to the origin of the sample through an online system or a phone. I will now elaborate on the emergency medical services and evacuations. An emergency medical services plan has been developed considering the requirements for COVID-19 and it is based on Uganda's population. Under this plan, a total of 310 ambulances have been deployed at both central and district level to support the COVID-19 response. It is for purposes of evacuating positive cases. Management of COVID-19 cases at the district level. COVID-19 positive cases will be managed in designated health facilities within the district or referred as per the referral guidelines. Mild and moderate cases will be managed at the district level, while severe and critical cases, like those requiring oxygen therapy or intensive care units, will be referred to the regional referral hospitals. The number of hospital beds that can be made available in public hospitals for COVID-19 management while allowing other regular medical services to go on concurrently is as follows. Mulago Specialized Hospital, 900 beds. Specialized Women and Neonatal Hospital, 450 beds. 16 regional referral hospitals will provide 30 isolation beds each, giving a total of 480 beds. 50 general hospitals will provide 20 isolation beds each, giving a total of 1,000 beds. 
164 health center fours will provide five isolation beds each, giving a total of 820 beds. Additionally, working with the private sector and the private not-for-profit, bed capacity will be increased as and when required. Regarding intensive care unit facilities, the intensive care unit facilities for critical cases will be provided at Mulago Hospital where we have 36 adult beds and 27 pediatric beds. The women's hospital which has 35 adult beds and 30 pediatric beds and the regional referral hospitals that have 10 beds each on average giving us a total of 480 ICU beds. Guidance on institutional quarantine. Exposed people, in this case returnees from countries that were already reporting cases of COVID-19 are subjected to quarantine. The purpose of the quarantine is to ensure that one does not expose their families, friends, and the community to the virus and risk of infection. Following Cabinet's approval of institutional quarantine on the 17th March and the setup of the Interministerial Task Force for the Management of COVID-19, several hotels and schools were identified for this purpose. And to date, 1,000 and 15 persons have been quarantined using this methodology. Persons under institutional quarantine will be followed up for 14 days. Bef before discharge, the following procedures will be undertaken. A. A quarantine facility where no one develops symptoms by the 14th day Samples will be taken from all inhabitants on the 15th day for testing to rule out the presence of asymptomatic persons who may be shedding the virus. If results are negative, the inhabitants will be discharged to begin another 14 days of self-isolation in their homes with follow-up by Ministry of Health officials for us to be doubly sure that there is no ongoing infection. B, a quarantine facility where one person develops symptoms will necessitate beginning the count of the 14 days from the date of evacuation of the positive case and the cycle continues. C, a negative test when one is asymptomatic but with contact history cannot rule out preclinical or asymptomatic infection and a repeat test is required within 14 days. D. Having a negative test when one is symptomatic does not rule out COVID-19. A test should be repeated within another seven to 10 days. Movement of health workers. During the lockdown guidelines issued by His Excellency the President, health workers were classified under the essential service provider category and will continue working as before. Those working on the COVID-19 response are required to submit details of their vehicles, both private and facility owned, to the Under Secretary Ministry of Health to obtain a sticker to enable them move freely and at all times. Two, those providing other health care services, including those in the private and private not-for-profit facilities are required to submit their details, including their institutional and national identity cards, 
to the Ministry of Works and Transport in order to obtain a sticker to allow free movement. They will be given clearly marked stickers to facilitate their movement during this lockdown period. Three, for those who use public transport, Kampala Capital City Authority will station buses in defined locations for you to board and report to your place of work and return home. The standard operating procedures will be communicated by Kampala Capital City Authority. For health workers up country, the districts through the district health officers are required to make transport available through the following mechanisms. Number one, for those with private vehicles, a sticker should be issued through the office of the resident district commissioner working in conjunction with the Ministry of Works and Transport. Two, for those who use public transport, the district health officer working with the resident district commissioner is required to position vehicles in designated places for health workers to board and go to work and return home. Standard operating procedures must be followed to avoid overcrowding. Management of other health emergencies during the COVID-19 outbreak. The Ministry of Health is cognizant that in spite of the active COVID-19 outbreak, the population is prone to other health emergencies and women and children are especially vulnerable. In this regard, the public is advised to do as follows. Number one, routine immunization services across the country will continue on the scheduled days at the scheduled time. Health workers must continue providing the immunization services while adhering to the standard operating procedures issued by the Ministry of Health. However, there should not be more than five mothers with their children at any given time. In case you receive more than five mothers at a given time, you must carefully separate the mothers in different rooms and ensure there is adequate spacing between them. Mothers going for immunization services should carry the child's immunization card clearly showing the date of the next visit. Such caretakers will be allowed to board the available free transport or obtain clearance from the RDCs or the RCCs to use their personal vehicles and adhere to the standard operating procedures. Parents should note that parents usually to children in the settings at temp Suspended since the children are at home. This sub all parents are encouraged to take their children to the nearest health facility for vaccinations. I want to reiterate the routine immunization will continue as usual. Number four, all other services will continue as usual. Patients are free to access medical services during this time by boarding the available vehicles pre-positioned by the districts or KCCA, KCCA or use of personal vehicles after obtaining clearance. Number five, pregnant women are especially advised to deliver in health facilities. Kampala Capital City Authority and the district health officers have been advised to ensure pregnant women are given priority access to available vehicles prepositioned for transportation to the facilities. Number six, services for HIV and TB should continue. The differentiated service delivery model must be doubly strengthened to allow patients access their medication in a timely manner. 
KCCA and the district's health officers are advised to facilitate clients to access transport and access health services. I'll now speak about the points of entry for cargo transportation. A total of 53 points of entry have been activated to facilitate cargo transportation between Uganda and the neighboring countries. Additionally, guidelines for cargo transportation have been developed and shared with the line authorities. Screening of all cargo transporters will be undertaken at various stop points along their travel route. Those who develop symptoms will be quarantined and samples obtained for screening. The responsible person or country will be requested to send a team of two or three people to continue the journey. In addition, those bringing cargo by air will be screened at the airport and they will only be allowed to use one hotel that has been identified and designated by the airport authorities. We request all the crew bringing in cargo to adhere to these rules. The call center. Working with partners, MTN, Airtel, Communication for Development, Uganda, that is CDFU, Maristops, NITAU, the Anti-Corruption Unit, Rack Mount Limited, the Ministry of Health has increased the capacity of its call centers to handle more calls concurrently. The number of call center agents have been increased from 20 to 345 and will continue to work in three shifts for 24 hours every day. I would like to reiterate that the public is encouraged to call the Ministry of Health on 919. Again, I repeat, the public is encouraged to call the Ministry of Health in Call our toll free lines on zero eight double zero one two zero three zero double three or zero eight double zero three zero three zero double three or WhatsApp on zero seven seven zero eight one eight one thirty nine to enable our surveillance officers assist you. I will repeat the toll free lines. You are free to call Ministry of Health on nine one nine. It is a toll free line. The other toll free lines are zero eight double zero one double zero zero six six. O zero eight double zero two zero three zero double three O zero eight double zero three zero three zero double three O send a WhatsApp message to zero seven seven zero eight one eight one thirty nine to enable our surveillance teams to assist you. I will now move to the issue of risk communication and allow me to introduce the commissioner responsible for this, Dr. Kavanda. Please show yourself. The Ministry of Health has rolled out the COVID-19 national communication campaign targeting over 42 million Ugandans to sensitize and encourage them to embrace, adopt, and sustain desired behaviors and practices for the prevention and management of COVID-19. The campaign dubbed Tonsemberera supports the government's and private sector efforts in ensuring that the people become the center of action in the prevention of the spread of the virus 
as promoted by His Excellency the President. The Ton Semberera, keep your distance slogan was selected based on the key insight that social distancing is a key behavior in the fight against COVID-19. This, however, doesn't in any way downplay the role of other behaviors. Tonsemberera embodies social and physical distancing from people, but also insinuates distancing from the virus by following the actions promoted by the global COVID-19 challenge communication campaign. The private sector has been very supportive to the COVID-19 risk communication sensitization campaign. And their support includes the caller tunes that we all now have on our phones, messages on billboards, SMS, radios, television, spot messages, social media messaging, and many others. And want to appreciate them in a special way. I will now move to psychosocial support. In a bid to strengthen psychosocial support, health workers have been oriented in providing psychosocial first aid and debriefing as they care for people affected with COVID-19. This has been done in Entebbe, Naguru, and Mulago Specialized Hospital, as well as all the regional referral hospitals in the country. The training continues to be rolled down to the districts. Each of the facilities is equipped with a team of four to six psychosocial providers to provide counseling to the patients with COVID-19 within the facilities and to the health workers as well. A team of 23 providers, including psychologists from the Uganda Counseling Association, social workers, psychiatric clinical officers, and nurses from Butavika National Referral Hospital, and some non-government organizations and psychiatrists have been deployed to quarantine facilities to counsel and assess the needs of the people under quarantine. The team has also managed to link patients to different pillars for better management. Health workers are also being trained in self-care, which includes messages like keep reasonable working hours to avoid exhaustion, helping people help themselves. Remember, you are not responsible for solving all people's problems. Minimize use of alcohol, caffeine, or tobacco. Find ways to support each other. Check in with fellow helpers and have them check in with you. Talk with friends, loved ones, or other trusted people. Be sure that you know how to observe all the appropriate safety measures. Take time to rest, eat, and relax, even for short periods. Take time to rest and relax before resuming work and other life duties. So far, the team is reaching out to people from different hotels and health facilities for counseling services. Research. The ministry and its partners is preparing several protocols in order to use this epidemic to understand the virus, the disease, and how to prevent and manage within our setting, including psychosocial and behavioral aspects of the disease. As we are all aware, this is a new virus. It is three months old, and we are all learning every day. Appreciation. Lastly, I would like to, in a, spe in a special way and with deep appreciation, recognize the tireless efforts of the health workers, public, private, not for profit, private service providers, 
understand. Work, that the work you are doing on a daily basis created for the noble work that you are doing in this fight against COVID-19. This is a difficult time, but I trust and know that you are up to the task. Keep calm, be well composed, and do your work diligently, observing all the preventive measures to ensure you too do not infect. You are valuable to us. Your health will do its best to ensure signs and symptoms of COVID-19 do not go to the health facilities, but are duly managed within specified centers in order to avoid infecting health workers. In conclusion, I would like to appreciate the Ministerial Scientific Advisory Committee, the private sector, other government ministries, departments and agencies, the non-government organizations, civil society, the Interreligious Council of Uganda, and individual families for supporting the COVID-19 risk in kind, financially and technically. The unity exhibited in this response is great, and we are all proud of all of you. The ministry continues to appeal to the general public to remain calm and practice the preventive measures. Wash your hands with soap and water, or use an alcohol-based hand wrap as frequently as possible, or at least three times a day. Maintain a social distance of at least four meters. And if you have flu-like symptoms, cover your nose and mouth with a mask. Lastly, again, to report any suspected cases of COVID-19, call the Ministry of Health toll-free lines 0800-100-100. Zero eight double zero two zero three zero double three or zero eight double zero three zero three zero double three. You can also call the shorter toll free code on nine one nine. Residents of Kampala are advised to call zero eight double zero nine nine zero 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 or zero two zero four six six zero eight one six i'll repeat residents of kampala are advised to call zero eight double zero nine nine zero 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 or zero two zero four six six zero eight one six i thank you all for listening to me please stay at home and keep safe. God bless. And uh, maybe just before you step down, um, we, we want to thank you so much for this very comprehensive report that you've given to the nation uh, this morning. Uh, we have uh, members of the press here who are likely invited to ask you a few questions. But um, just for me, Africa's toll is still very lower than uh, that in the Middle East, in, in Asia, the U.S., and everywhere. And some experts are actually casting doubt on our testing skills, uh, thinking that a very vulnerable uh, continent like ours actually ought to have had um, uh, numbers that are raising every other day. Um, you may uh, wish to actually answer to us whether our testing skills yes, uh, to also just uh, cast away all the doubt that um, what we are doing is really authentic and when we hear of the same negatives we trust that these are the negatives well thank you very much for the questions as I indicated in the beginning I came with my scientific advisory team and so they are also here to answer very the questions good. and I will ask the person to whom the question was directed mm. to answer the question. Thank you so much, Doctor. I will request that you, you sit. You can guide them where to. Thank, thank you so much. Well, I request that you sit as uh, the uh, technical person prepared answers or response to the question that I just asked. So uh, now.
with the opportunity to invite members of the press. Walter from NTV, um, I think you're the first to come and ask a question. As um, S gets ready, then we'll have one from uh, uh, Daily Monitor uh, and New Vision in that order. L let's first have those, then we we'll see where it gets. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I have uh, a couple of questions. There is a concern about some people who have been asked to extend days in quarantine due to some standards that one weren't followed uh, how do you respond to that and uh, the president talked about talked of a budget that was being drawn to purchase some ppe for the health workers would like on that uh, there are some questions that for example or you know, rest things of that nature if a neighbor has you know a private car and they supposed to help if they can it's still a question out there and uh, the uvri thank you thank you so much uh, walter from um, ntv um, we have another question here from nbs please you step up as a daily monitor uh, get ready as uh, also a uh, new vision uh, uh, new vision gets ready uh, to come and ask in that order then we take on more. Your name is Zahra Namali, a journalist with NBS Television. Just a couple of questions. One, uh, the last communication we had from you, you promised to give us results from Iganga. What is the status of the father and mother of the baby? And uh, are there any contacts that you've been able to identify in Iganga in relation to the eight months old baby? In Hoima, how many contacts have you been able to identify? In Ajumani too, how many contacts have you been able to identify? Uh, in relation to the testing kits, um, the first protocol was from China. There seems to be too many, uh, it could be public opinion on the quality of things from China. Is it what we are still using as a country? And um, for the people still uh, in quarantine, you say they'll have to be tested. From UVRI, they say they have a budget of about 1 billion shillings, and they have only 25,000 testing kits uh, still in stock. Will you be able to handle uh, testing all the people in quarantine, uh, whom you say will be, most of them will be having a double core at this particular time? Thank you so much, uh, Namuli from NBS. And I uh, trust you just observe the guidelines that were given to us and uh, what we are all trying to emphasize and to do. Uh, please, when you step on the microphone there, remember to sanitize. Uh, that there is enough sanitizer here for us um, to, to just be sure that actually um, you um, are keeping safe and uh, ready for that. Welcome. And um, you make your question uh, uh, short and brief and precise to the point. Okay. Thank <laughs> you very much. Uh, my name is Damali Muhaye. I'm from Daily Monitor and KFM. Uh, Honorable Minister, I would like to know when the ministry is planning to bring on board the private hospitals to also start testing uh, for coronavirus. We know that uh, some of the government hospitals are overwhelmed, so we would like to know when are you doing this and what should the private hospitals have to start testing for coronavirus. And number two, uh, in your address, you say that uh, there are over 662 people who have gotten into contact with the 33 confirmed cases. We would like to know how many people or how many Ugandans got into contact with the 44 confirmed cases of coronavirus and how many have you so far uh, gotten and how many are missing. Uh, number three, we also want to know the number of people who traveled from Dubai or from number one countries. How many are they? You said you have already gotten their contacts mm -hmm. and you're going to trace them, but you did not give us the number, the actual number of those people. And uh, when do you plan to complete bringing all of them on board? And uh, the issue of uh, uh, budgets, how, many, how much money has the Ministry of Health put aside for COVID-19? And last year for me, on the issue of uh, a suspect who is said to have escaped from the quarantine and he's said to be in Omoro district. We want to get more details about that. How did he escape and where is he? Have you been able to get him? Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much. As uh, uh, um, uh, uh, we have one from uh, New Vision, uh, Bukede. Well, let's have Bukede before Emma, you come on. Uh, let's have Bukede. Um, Honorable Minister, to add on the question of uh, the budget, um, uh, when the President was speaking to us last, he intimated uh, the cost of doing testing, which is $65. That, that's about 250,000 Uganda shillings. And uh, people think um, when they actually are discovered positive, um, they pay that $65, $65 uh, for maybe the testing, and then who also meets the cost? of actually keeping them in hospital and treating them for um, uh, if they are actually proven uh, positive. Welcome, Bukede. Uh, my name is called Shamshad Narija mm -hmm. from Bukede TV. My, my first question is, people living with HIV are complaining. They are being left out. For example, when, when, they, when, they, when they want to go to get the medicine, they are being caned. They don't know how to move. How, how are you going to handle that? Then, last week, members of parliament paid a visit to some of the isolation centers and then the, doctor, the doctors complained they don't have protective gears. How are you going to also, to also handle that? Then, then lastly, police officers, we already see them on the streets implement, implementing the, the presidential directive without, without protective gears. How is that also going to be handled? Okay. Well, thank you so much. Emma, come and ask. Then we'll have the responses from um, uh, the take and call uh, staff of the ministry and uh, the minister has of if she so wishes to uh, give responses to some of these questions. Thank you very much. Emmanuel Ayenebiona, the Ministry of Health spokesperson. There are questions that are coming uh, through WhatsApp and on also online. Uh, the uh, Honorable Minister, thank you for your address. Uh, the public would like to know the modeling. Uh, is it premised on the current situation of the lockdown or outside uh, the lockdown? Uh, because we want to know these figures, whether this situation is going to happen with even the lockdown measures. Another question is to do that 25 of, uh, percent of the patients in the U.S. are asymptomatic. So how are we going to deal with that uh, situation in Uganda if we have uh, patients who are asymptomatic and are out there in the community? I thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, maybe as the response has come, Honorable Minister, there is one question here that is also coming through SMS saying, what about the farmers who are actually going to their gardens? And uh, many of them want to access their gardens. The country has not locked down. Uh, life has not stopped. As we're fighting COVID, we need to plow, do all these things. And uh, um, if they're far away from their gardens, um, how do they access them? I think because uh, there is uh, a crackdown on um, who walks when and how and everything. I think we'll now take on the responses from uh, the technical staff of uh, the Ministry. You're very welcome. Uh, yes, I think. Um, very, thank you. Okay, thank you. I will help coordinate the responses. Uh, uh, the questions that I have here from NTV, uh, Walter, uh, concern on extending days. Uh, Dr. Roda kindly come and uh, respond to the concern of uh, extending days. Ideally, uh, when, a, when a case emerges from a quarantine area, uh, initially the, the quarantine was implemented in a manner which wasn't uh, quite rigorous and people kept mis mixing and uh, so when, when we picked up new cases, we made sure that instead of release people that have been exposed, uh, we have to start a count uh, afresh. Uh, maybe Dr. Roda, you should explain this. Okay, so thank you for that, uh, raising that question. Uh, first, I would like to say that uh, quarantine doesn't come so easy for all of us, and we feel the pain uh, for those that are in quarantine. We also do feel the pain for the family members that have been doing a countdown, and we're looking forward to seeing their loved ones. But we're dealing with a difficult um, condition here. We have people that have tested positive within the facilities where these people have been. And we want to be sure that we are not releasing people that have been in the same facilities, especially if they have had 
any form of contact with these people uh, to your families, to your friends, and everyone out there. So much as we feel for them, we think that it's very crucial that people that have been in contact with those that have tested positive within these facilities should extend the quarantine for another 14 days and they will be supported to ensure that they are able to cope and go through um, this period and this will be done whether they have symptoms or not which is related to the question that was raised about 25% uh, of the people that have tested positive uh, within the U.S. Uh, being asymptomatic. And we know that data from other countries, like in Asia, is showing that it goes up to 50% of the people that have tested positive actually being asymptomatic, but they are still capable of transmitting the virus. This is the reason why the contacts are tracked and also followed up and quarantined whether they have symptoms or not. Thank you. About the budget and the use of uh, cars to transport, I will leave these other questions to the minister. Uh, is UVRI overwhelmed? Professor Pontiano, please kindly come and talk about the testing and uh, whether you are overwhelmed. Take that. And that you again say your name for purposes of uh, those watching us and uh, because we're broadcasting this uh, for a better tax and tagging your name rightly. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm Professor Pontiano Karebu, Director of Uganda Virus Research Institute. There are a couple of questions that have come up that I would like to address. First, you asked whether in Africa do we have the skills to test. I want to assure you we have the skills. I mentioned before that the test we're using for COVID is not new. The serial time PCR, which we have used for years for other infections, in uh, HIV, hepatitis, and all that. All we had to do was to use a new protocol where we have what we call new primers to make sure that we can detect the COVID-19. So the technique is not new. We have used it in Africa. Many labs have it. Uh, it's not new. And it good, the good thing, even when, when you're doing these tests, there are controls. Yeah, There are positive controls, negative controls that can allow you to see whether what you're doing is proper or not proper. So you should not be concerned about the skills. The skills are there and they've been there for quite some time. What now we're addressing this is a new disease there are of course samples that are a little bit uh, complicated now we have had uh, one or two of those ones that are just above the borderline cutoff we have consulted some countries where they have uh, slightly different cutoffs so we have these samples that are borderline and what we have decided if it's a borderline we are not going to repeat uh, to report it as positive but get uh, uh, a, a, another sample. And this is what we're doing for the two samples from Iganga and Adjuman, which were a bit borderline. And we'll be very frank when we get the results and tell you what we get by repeating these specimens because they have caused a, a little bit of uh, uh, anxiety and uh, um, not no, uh, knowing exactly what is happening. So we are repeating these samples and as soon as we have the results, we shall communicate them, uh, uh, this. But this is normal within these tests. Sometimes you get samples that are, are, are of, of borderline. So we are working on that. Is UVRI overwhelmed? So far we are not yet overwhelmed. But if the epidemic uh, uh, expands, we need to be prepared. We may be overwhelmed. So we have put together steps. In the case, the lab that is doing the test now is in one department. If they get overwhelmed, there are other departments that can come on to support. And then we're also putting, taking an inventory of what other labs in the country have so that we can uh, uh, um, uh, take on more, more more labs. So we have put in measures. For now, we are not yet overwhelmed, but we have put in measures to make sure that if we are overwhelmed, other labs can c come in. We talked about the 20,000 kits in, uh, in, in stock. Uh, these are the uh, from uh, uh, the WHO CDC, the Berlin Protocol, and the Chinese from uh, Alibaba, but we are ordering. We are ordering more. But one of the challenges that we need to know under the lockdown, procurement becomes a challenge. So uh, uh, reagents take uh, uh, some time to, to come, and that is the worries we have. 
but others were ordering more. Uh, and uh, what is all happening also, th these challenges, the demand is global where we get these reagents. But we're making sure that we have these uh, 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 kits uh, in place and we are uh, ordering uh, some of uh, the, 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 these kits. They, they, they asked about the Chinese protocol, the quality, what we do, whatever kit we're getting, we're evaluating it and we're uh, conducting what we call performance assessment, which is very important. We have a lot of demand, many kits coming in, but we're making sure that we do evaluation and performance assessment. Our priority, is, first of all, is to use kits. The priority is to use kits that are FDA or WHO, FDA approves, but not this time because of the emergency. They are calling it uh, em emergency. Uh, they are giving some uh, approvals under emergency, uh, not the normal approvals. And those are our priorities and the WHO that uh, approved kits as we look at others. The rapid tests have not yet come, but we are going to evaluate them so that the labs, uh, if uh, the epidemic the pandemic expands more and more labs can have access to the testing and in fact from uh, today we are taking off blood specimens and we are appealing to those who are in quarantine those who are in the clinics in addition to uh, looking after them to provide a specimen of blood sample so that we can also evaluate uh, those blood-based kits uh, that could be used uh, uh, for uh, uh, as rapid so we are doing all this I think those they, they talked about the the cost of sixty five dollars uh, per test. Many people have been asking us. We said we are because we are getting uh, 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 reagents from different sources, and some of the re reagents were donated. My colleagues are coming together with the cost per test, and we shall be communicating that cost per test uh, as because uh, as they put together because we are getting some of the reagents from this source the other source so they are putting this together and because there's interest in this we shall provide that information as soon as possible I think those are the Prof, before you go I think uh, when will the private sector come in okay the private sector that's very important the private sector I think we need to go step by step if the work becomes overwhelming for you VRI different the private sector has to come in. the key thing is to have a system of evaluating the new kits that are coming in so that we are sure these are working very well then also as the private sector comes in there's a system of uh, looking at the quality of work hmm? Qu continuous quality assessment that they provide good re we have done it for other tests for for other infections HIV hepatitis private sector comes in but as a minister, I think we have a responsibility to ensure that whether you are private or public, you are providing good results. So that quality assessment, continuous assessment will continue, training staff, providing uh, panels uh, uh, so that we can look at the results to ensure that quality results are given out. So all this is not closed, but it will be step by step. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, we had a question from uh, Damali uh, from uh, the Daily Monitor asking about uh, escapee from uh, quarantine. Kano, Kano Chobe, I will ask you to come as incident commander and respond to, to this. There were questions around numbers, but uh, you know, we've just jumped to 44 and the teams are still tracing to we will tell you about please use that microphone uh somebody i think escaped from quarantine and uh, damali wanted to know what is being done uh, yeah this uh, thank you so much for the question and to answer this question first of all oh <laughs> thank you so much my name is russian Kano, dr henry chobe bossa this case, this guy, this person who escaped is being traced uh, using the RDC and the, and the district security officer. But I want to answer the questions that were raised uh, on the contacts that we have uh, 660 contacts to 33 cases. We, by the time the ministers. Uh, brief was prepared that was that but by 10 this has been the 44 cases we have the contacts for all of them 
the number comes to 766. The other question was how many contacts to the case in Iganga, those are seven. And the two cases in Hoima, case one, we have 72, 77 contacts. And the second case, we have 25 contacts. That comes to 102 for the contacts in Hoima under four up. Police officers implementing the directives without PPE? They are doing a, a good job. And the guidance to them is that uh, they maintain distance and the PPE is being procured to make sure that they are well protected. That's not all, but we are orienting them to make sure that they observe the measures as, as uh, put out by the president. A distance of four meters and making sure that you have no contact, hand washing and making sure that uh, you, you, they, don't, uh, they don't touch the, 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 the people. I think the most important thing to note is that PPE is not uh, for everybody and uh, not everybody is going to put on PPE and uh, maybe Dr. Pauline come and talk about why PPE is important for the people who are actually at the front line dealing with the identified and confirmed cases. Uh, thank you, Kanocho. Thank you. Maybe I, want to, yes. I would like to answer one question. The question was how many travelers from Dubai? We've obtained a manifest. We are working on the numbers and to be able to get to get their details. But we request that if they travel from Dubai, they reach out to us on the call numbers that were shared by the minister so that we, we test them. Thank you. Please. My name is Professor Pauline Biachika Chibuika. The question I'm to answer is regarding PPE. Why is it important? PPE is personal protective equipment. Why is it important? It's important to avoid one being exposed to infection, especially when they're caring for somebody who is already infected. So this is very, very crucial for the health workers. And um, the health workers, we have seen the news going around. Many health workers have been infected in other areas. So this is very, very important. PPE currently has been made available in the designated COVID treatment centers. And I know that the Ministry of Health is working around the clock to make it available, widely available. However, we also need to note that with the global pandemic, PPE has become a commodity that everybody is, is, is procuring. So it is quite difficult to get um, uh, PPE during this crisis, but we know that our Ministry of Health is doing all that they can to get this PPE available. So health workers must use appropriate PPE. And for each category of risk, there's designated PPE to be used. Not everybody will wear the full-blown PPE, depending on where the health worker is working, if you're in the community, or if you're in the triage area, or if you're actually within the ward treating the mild cases compared to somebody who is in the intensive care unit treating those severely ill patients who may actually be aerosolizing um, virus in the ICU, different categories of PPE will be required. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, uh, brother, uh, Professor Wanyes, I'm going to invite you back uh, to clarify issues on modeling. I think this question came through SMSs uh, from the PRO, the, mo the current modeling of numbers uh, in Uganda, and uh, the, the fact that 25% of patients uh, in the U.S. have been found to be asymptomatic. How does this possibly happen? Happening now.